So, fascism. In my last video, I read some of Italian dictator Benito Mussolini's writings and definitions of fascism without any commentary or analysis. That was not easy. In theory, you should have seen the first video, but I recognize that political writings are hard to get through. So I've done this video as my analysis and commentary on Mussolini's work, and even if you didn't watch the last vid, you'll probably still be okay. Probably. Still, it's there as a source of reference. This is the second script and third recording of this video, and I will explain why. When I read Mussolini's first writing, you'll notice that I read each section in order and that each section was numbered, and so that was exactly how I wrote my original response. But Mussolini didn't exactly build things up in a logical order when he did that. There's foundational, peripheral, and tertiary attributes of fascism scattered throughout each section. So Mussolini sort of builds the house from one end to the other rather than start with a completely foundational approach and then going from there. I'd rather lay this out foundationally and then give you the walls and the roof to show you what fascism's house is built on and what it really looks like. So let's dive in and deconstruct the doctrine of fascism. There are foundational ideas to fascism that are scattered throughout the reading. Keep in mind, these might not be objectively true, but what's important here is that Mussolini and fascism believes these things to be true about fascism. In the early sections, Mussolini says that fascism is not only born out of historical reality and an objective view of history, but that fascism is aligned with nature itself the nature of man, of things and their laws, and aligned with the way the universe works. So, fascism is, according to Mussolini, consistent with nature, morality, religion, spirituality, history, and so on. Alignment with fascism is alignment with the truth of the universe, and to fight it is to fight against the natural state of things. Now, because of the all-encompassing rightness of fascism, Mussolini correctly writes that fascism isn't just a system of government. It's also a system of thought. And as a system of thought, it's good enough for, well, everything. Mussolini puts it this way. Fascism is a totalizing concept, and the fascist state, the unification and synthesis of every value, interprets, develops, and potentiates the whole life of the people. In other words, fascism is so complete and thorough in its evaluation of human life that there's really not much that's outside of the interest of fascism. Fascism isn't just interested in the political part of your life, it's interested in all of your life and there's no possibility for opting out. But fascism isn't just interested in being disciplined and orderly and organized for the sake of itself. No, it has a manifestation in mind, an apparatus and an entity that is the expression of all of the values that Mussolini espouses. The manifestation of these fascist values is found in one place and one place only, the state. The state, the state, the state, the state, the state. Let's just never speak of that. So what is the state under fascism, and what does it do? Here's what Mussolini had to say on the nature of the fascist state, a series of quotes in no particular order. All is comprised in the state, and nothing spiritual or human exists, much less has any value, outside of the state. All within the state, nothing outside the state, nothing against the state. The state, in fact, as a universal ethical will, is the creator of right. There can be no conception of a state which is not fundamentally a conception of life. The nation is created by the state, which gives the people their will and thereby an effective existence. Fascism reaffirms the state as the only true expression of the individual. For Mussolini in the original doctrine of fascism, everything comes back to the state. Now, this has significant impact on concepts like individualism, religion, democracy, capitalism, economics, race, class, and so on, and we'll be diving into some of those very shortly. But if you remember from the end of the first video, I encouraged you, as the viewer, to consider what Mussolini's big idea was, and part of that big idea is the totality and the completeness of the state. For Mussolini, the state isn't the main thing. The state 
is everything. In the section, The Role of the State, Mussolini writes that, quote, the fascist state, the highest and most powerful form of personality, is a force. It reassumes all the forms of the moral and intellectual life of man. It is an internal form and rule, a discipline of the entire person. It penetrates the will as well as the intelligence. Its principle, a central inspiration to the living human personality in the civil community, descends into the depths and settles in the heart of the man of actions, as well as the thinker, the artist, as well as of the scientist. For Mussolini, fascism is a guiding ideal that should and does permeate all avenues of thought and belief, almost like a religion. Mussolini didn't miss that. In fact, that's rather his point. The state should be something deeply and even spiritually connected to all aspects of the lives of the civil populace. My libertarian sensibilities reasonably hate this. So what's the deal with this big, intimate state that Mussolini loves so much? Why is this state his main focus and idea? Well, this gets into the why, and why arguments are causal arguments, so I will lightly and carefully state that from my reading of this work and others by Mussolini, it seems that he was in love with the idea of greatness, of action, and making things happen, of making history. He was a pompous man, infatuated with his own intellect, and in love with the idea of being destined for historical greatness, and thus his ideas are often grandiose and fantastic. He wrote that, quote, man without a part in history is nothing. The state then gives its people an effective existence to make their mark on history. Mussolini had ideas about class and wealth disparity, about organized and productive society, and so on, and all of these ideas are only possible through state power, through a government making or even forcing these good things to happen. For Mussolini, a man or an idea apart from the state was not just powerless, but therefore also meaningless. And that's because fascism can conceive of no question where the state is not the answer, of no problem where the state is not the solution, of no lack where the state is not the great supplier. For any deficiency, the state is sufficient. Fascism, as Mussolini originally conceived it, is the overarching completeness of the state as the whole function and end goal of a society, a totalitarian view of state-centric beliefs that essentially yields a form of state worship. Fascism is the religion, the economics, the politics, and the belief in and of the omnipotent state to make things right. So what does this mean for various avenues of thought? How does fascism relate to concepts like individualism or liberty and democracy? And what does fascism say about socialism, religion, and race? Mussolini addresses these ideas in the doctrine of fascism, and so that is what we will try to answer next. And we'll start with the concept of individualism. Individualism is shunned under fascism because fascism is a form of collectivism, and like many or most forms of state collectivism, opting out is not possible. But fascism is not merely collectivist. It is also, quote, anti-individualistic. The fascist conception is for the state. It is for the individual only insofar as he coincides with the state. Mussolini saw classical liberalism as something that affirmed the interests of the individual at the expense of the state. He rejected this idea, saying that fascism reaffirms the state as the only true expression of the individual. In other words, fascism supports your individualistic ideas and desires as long as they coincide or support or benefit the state. But ultimately, your existence is and should be one of what Mussolini calls self-abnegation, a selfless life of duty where you sacrifice your particular interests to the collective. He wrote that the citizen of the fascist state is no longer a selfish individual who has the antisocial right of rebelling against any law of the collectivity. Mussolini's flawed idea here is that whatever is done is done because it's good first and foremost for the state, and therefore it will all also be good for the individual. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. This is very important to realize, and there's a reason we started with individualism, because in a way, it's very foundational to all the concepts that we will address next. 
Under fascism, individuals who are not fully invested in what the state is doing are a drag on the efforts of the collective state. Thus, the state needs to be all-powerful and superior to the individual because it ensures that every individual only does what's best for the collective in the most efficient way possible. Individualism leads to wrong choices against the collective, at least in the view of fascism. This is why fascism is not only anti-individualistic, but it's also why it's totalizing and totalitarian. It must control the potential bad decisions that individuals choose outside of state interests, and it achieves this control by either indoctrination or by force. Now, we can't really talk about the expression of individualism or the lack thereof under fascism without talking about liberty, and Mussolini actually ties these ideas together in some of his writings. Liberty is your freedom to do things, to exercise your rights and express your individualism in a way that you see fit. And in the eyes of fascism, that is a very dangerous idea. So what Mussolini does here is redefine what real liberty is, and he does the same thing with other concepts, as we shall soon see. But regarding liberty, Mussolini wrote that, quote, if liberty is to be the attribute of the real man and not of the scarecrow invented by individualistic liberalism, then fascism is for liberty. It is for the only kind of liberty that is serious, the liberty of the state and of the individual in the state, because for the fascist, all is comprised in the state, and nothing spiritual or human exists, much less has any value, outside the state. He would also remark that liberty is a duty, not a right. Liberty, then, under fascism, is only the freedom to do what your state needs you to do, and to do what is best for your government. Mussolini would write that, the fascist state organizes the nation, but leaves a sufficient margin afterwards to the individual. It has limited the useless or harmful liberties and has preserved the essential ones. The one to judge in this respect is not the individual, but the state. So it's the state that decides what liberties are essential or what constitutes a sufficient margin of liberty for the individual. It is the state that decides what rights, freedoms, and margins you should have. The point here is that the state's ability to define, limit, and grant your liberties as an individual are based on what the state thinks is best for itself. Thus, your liberty is a dangerous idea. Think of the first two amendments, for example. Your ability to speak freely with any idea you wish and your freedom to own a weapon and defend yourself have some potential to be used for state interests, but they have far more potential to not be used in state interest or even be used against state interests. You might speak freely on the idea of limiting state power or tax cuts and rally people to your cause. You might be harder to control if you're armed. These freedoms empower you and not the state. They directly benefit your autonomy and your self-sovereignty. And that's why Mussolini says that what constitutes a sufficient margin for your freedoms is something that the state decides. Fascism is interested in maximizing a lot of things, but your freedom isn't one of them. I'm sure you figured out by now that fascism isn't very democratic at all in practice, but Mussolini wants to counter-argue that it's really the purest and best form of democracy. He does this by redefining what democracy actually is. He wrote that, quote, The state is not merely the numbers or the sum of individuals forming the majority of a people. Fascism, for this reason, is opposed to the democracy which identifies peoples with the greatest number of individuals and reduces them to a majority level. But if people are conceived as they should be, qualitatively, and not quantitatively, then fascism is democracy in its purest form. The qualitative conception is the most coherent and truest form and is therefore the most moral because it sees a people realized in the consciousness and in the will of a few or even of one only. Mussolini is saying that fascism is opposed to the majority vote being what democracy is. The greatest quantity of voters isn't what's right, it's the quality of voters who understand what the people really want, what the real public consciousness desires, and the voters who vote for that thing are the real true voters and measure of democracy. These people are the best measure of democratic will, even if they're the minority or even just one 
person. This allows Mussolini to define the right voters as pretty much any group he chooses and still say that he is for the best and truest form of democracy. But his disdain for American democracy is plain to see. And in 1928, he told Edwin James of the New York Times, quote, democracy is beautiful in theory. In practice, it is a fallacy. You in America will see that someday. As a general rule, Mussolini was a bit of a control freak. He didn't like things that couldn't be controlled by the state for the state's own direct benefit. This applies to capitalism, among other things. Now, in the original doctrine of fascism, Mussolini doesn't go after capitalism explicitly, but rather implicitly. Yet in other writings and statements, it's plain to see that he really isn't a capitalist at all. So consider this a freebie because A, it's relevant and B, I love you guys. Anyway, in the early 1930s, Mussolini stated that the capitalistic method of production is out of date. So is the doctrine of laissez-faire, the theoretical basis for capitalism. Mussolini saw Italy as having a form of capitalism, but he also noted that, quote, Italy is not a capitalist country, according to the meaning now conventionally assigned to the term, unquote. In 2015, Lawrence Samuels wrote that, quote, on numerous occasions, Benito Mussolini identified his economic policy policies with state capitalism, the exact phrase that Vladimir Lenin used to usher in his new economic policy. This is likely because Mussolini was a longtime socialist, and socialism was a belief system that continuously influenced Mussolini in some form or fashion. So what did state capitalism under fascism look like? The answer to that is very state-owned, run, and controlled. Thus, it stands to reason that Mussolini once boasted that three-fourths of the Italian economy, industrial or agricultural, is in the hands of the state. The economy of the state is so vital to state success that the state had to control the economy. But how far did this control extend, and practically what did it look like? Lawrence Samuels wrote about this in an excellent article entitled The Socialist Economics of Italian Fascism. Here's a passage that explains it better than I can. As the effects of the Great Depression lingered, Italy's government bailed out failing businesses and seized the stockholders of banks which held large equity interests. The Italian state took over bankrupt corporations, cartelized businesses, and increased government spending, expanding the money supply, and boosted deficits. Mussolini acknowledged fascism's socialist roots and influences. Among those he acknowledged as influencing fascism were French Marxist Georges Sorel and French revolutionary unionist Hubert Lagardelle. Under the fascism of the corporate state, planning boards set product lines, production levels, prices, wages, working conditions, and the size of firms. No economic activity could be undertaken without government permission. These measures restricted new business from forming or expanding. Moreover, levels of consumption were dictated by the state and excess incomes had to be surrendered as taxes or loans. By the late 1930s, about 80% of available credit was controlled directly or indirectly by the state. With the passage of the Bank Reform Act in 1936, the Bank of Italy and most of the other major banks became government entities. One year earlier, the confiscation of capital had begun with state edicts requiring all banks, businesses, and private citizens to surrender their foreign-issued stocks and bonds to the Bank of Italy. Mussolini doubled the number of Italian bureaucrats under an enormous bureaucracy of committees. By 1934, one Italian in five worked for the government. In 1939, Italy saw the highest rate of state-owned enterprises in the world outside of the Soviet Union. In that year, the state controlled over four-fifths of Italy's shipping and shipbuilding, three-quarters of its pig iron production, and almost half that of steel. Now let me ask you, does any of that sound like laissez-faire capitalism that Mises, Hayek, or Rand would approve of? Not so much, but perhaps most revealing is this quote from Mussolini. The fascist state directs and controls the entrepreneurs, whether it be in our fisheries or in our heavy industry in the Val d'Aosta. There, the state actually owns the mines and carries on transport, for the railways are state property. So are many of the factories. We term it state intervention. If anything fails to work properly, the state intervenes. The capitalists will go on doing what they are told down to the very end. They have no option and cannot put up any fight. 
capitalism, if it can be called that, under fascist rule is anything but a free market. It is highly controlled, regulated, suppressed, and made to do exactly what the state wants it to do. Mussolini remarked that it is no longer an economy aimed at individual profit, but economy concerned with collective interest. In the end, the so-called state capitalism of fascism looked nothing like what any self-respecting libertarian or laissez-faire capitalist would accept as true capitalism. In part two, we'll cover Mussolini's relationship with socialism and his thoughts on religion and race. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. Stay tuned.